Keeping it off. Seriously, Briah, why would you think I have the faintest idea on how to fix this old clunker? The frustration was evident in the woman's voice as they stood in the parking lot of Burns and Burns Grocers. Randy Wilson stopped mid-stride from his truck to the grocery store's entrance, drawn by the woman's vocal struggle. He observed her attempt to pry open the car's hood, the vehicles make an era a mystery to him, but clearly a relic from a time when Detroit's engineering was celebrated. A young girl, around 9 or 10, was there, alongside a boy of similar age, probably her brother. They both shared light brown hair, deep brown eyes, and looked equally worn out from the day. The woman, bending over the engine, caught Randy's attention for a different reason. Her determination and the way she was dressed made a lasting impression. He found himself appreciating her effort and style as he approached. Hey there, do you mind if I give it a try? Randy offered. Oh, please, if you could, Heather Aquine replied, clearly at her wit's end. So, what's it doing, or not doing? Randy inquired as he effortlessly popped the hood open. How did you do that? Briar asked, wide-eyed. Just here, see. There's a latch, Randy explained, pointing it out to Briar. Push it up, and the hood opens. That's awesome. The boy exclaimed. It just makes this terrible noise, Heather explained, looking hopeful as Randy inspected the engine. Randy nodded, let's see what we can do, and tinkered with a few components. Heather rushed to the driver's side and tried starting the car again. This time, after a hesitant groan and a couple of coughs, the engine roared to life. Randy made sure the kids were at a safe distance before closing the hood and signaling a thumbs up to Heather, then headed into the store. Hey, mister, Randy was greeted by the girl's voice as he perused the apples. What's up? Randy replied, turning with a smile. My mother told me to give you this, Briah said, her smile wide, as she extended a piece of paper toward him. It bore the name Heather Aquin and a contact number. Please extend my thanks to your mother, and I'll make sure to contact her tonight. Randy replied with a grin. Briah's laughter rang out as she hurried off. Randy watched her go, then turned his attention back to examining apples. The children, dressed neatly in simple outfits and inexpensive sneakers, were noticeably tidy. Randy noted that their mother was robust, a phrase Uncle Jack would have used, saying she had meat on her bones. Uncle Jack, a close family friend rather than a blood relative, had been a pillar of support for a struggling single mother and her rebellious son, Randy. Despite Randy's difficult demeanor, Uncle Jack had never given up on him. Even when Randy's actions landed him in the Stratton Medium Security Penitentiary for a five- to eight-year sentence, Uncle Jack made sure Randy's mother could visit him, driving her the long distance to the prison regularly. He encouraged Randy to make the most of the rehabilitation programs available, pushing him to improve himself while incarcerated. Come on, kid, you might as well make the best of this time, Uncle Jack would say. Taking that advice to heart, Randy earned his jet in prison and went on to learn welding, with financial aid from the Alejandro Lopez Grant. This initiative, coupled with Randy's good behavior, led to his early release. Upon his release, the grant also helped him find employment at a factory in Lowridge, Texas, that specialized in manufacturing vending machine frames. One day at the factory, the floor manager called out, Wilson, Mr. Holmes would like to see you. Randy, curious about the rare summons from Watson Holmes, the factory owner, found himself in a meeting where he wasn't even offered a seat. Instead, he was immediately informed about an employment opportunity with a company in Baylor Lake, Louisiana, that needed welders for offshore oil rigs. Impressed by Randy's meticulous work, Mr. Holmes had recommended him for the position. Eager for the new challenge, Randy asked, when do I start? To which Mr. Holmes responded with a knowing smile. Chris Fontenot was a fair boss, demanding diligence from his employees. He quickly identified those who were unproductive or inexperienced, valuing hard work and commitment. At Fontenot Equipment and Services, Randy earned a respectable income. Two years post-release from Stratton, Randy had acquired a pickup truck, a pleasant apartment in Magnolia Courtyard Apartments, and had the phone number of a woman. His cell phone contained contacts he could reach out to for casual meetups. If one wasn't available, he'd simply contact the next. Holding a chilled St. Elizabeth lager that evening, Randy decided to call Heather Aukoin. She playfully corrected the pronunciation of her surname, hinting that Randy was an outsider. They joked about the pronunciation, leading to an invitation from Heather for Randy to visit her the following evening for dinner as a gesture of appreciation for car repairs. Randy didn't mention her living in a trailer park, as he was familiar with such a lifestyle. Randy phoned his mother for her apple crumb cake recipe. His uncle Jack was eager to discuss Randy's work on the oil rig, intrigued by offshore drilling. Arriving at Heather's place, Randy noted the resemblance between her home and car. He cautiously ascended the worn steps and knocked on the weathered door. A young girl answered. Hi, you must be Briah. Randy inquired, recalling Heather's mention of her three children, Briah, Farley, and Danielle, who were enjoying their summer break. The girl giggled, revealing she was Farley, not Briah. Randy smiled, asking if he should come in or if they preferred to cool the outside air. Mom, the nice guy is here, Farley announced. Then let him in, Heather responded from inside. 
Hi, I'm the new guy. Randy introduced himself to a young girl who burst into the living room, curious about their visitor. Hello, Danielle grinned before dashing off again. Hi, everything's nearly done, Heather said, beaming from the kitchen. Randy noticed Heather had freshened up a bit, her soft brown hair styled nicely. She wore a casual, flowy sundress adorned with yellow and blue floral patterns. When mom wears makeup, I get to as well, Farley shared with their guest. Fair enough, Randy replied, why should she have all the fun, huh? Exactly, Farley exclaimed, pleased with Randy's understanding. Hi there, Briah greeted. Hi, and just so you know, I'm Randy, he introduced himself to Briah, who also had a touch of makeup. Randy Wilson. Hello Mr. Randy, Farley chimed in, what's that you brought? Oh, this is my mother's famous apple crumb cake, Randy explained, setting the foil wrap pan on the table. You really shouldn't have, Heather said, her smile warm. The dinner went well, filled with lively chatter. The three children, all resembling their mother, shared her gentle nature. Randy observed a hint of reservedness in her demeanor, a trait that seemed present in the children as well. Their home was modest, with few luxuries. A large, old television sat quietly in the corner, with no signs of modern entertainment devices. So, why don't you have any hair? Farley inquired innocently as Heather began to serve the dessert. Farley, that's not polite, Heather chided gently. It's okay, Randy reassured, finishing his drink. I don't mind explaining. Heather laughed softly, I should have known. No, no, Mr. Randy, the three kids chimed in, teaching him the correct pronunciation of their last name. After finishing the crumb cake, they settled into a game of life, navigating its simulated paths. Briah later took Danny to bed and helped Farley with his makeup removal. Heather and Randy cozied up on her uneven couch, sharing kisses and tender moments. Randy discovered Heather's lack of undergarments under her dress, leading to a more intimate connection. On his next visit, Randy treated the Aquoin family to mini-golf and Chinese food at Jade Garden, delighting in teaching the kids to use chopsticks. Their laughter brightened the usually summer atmosphere. Back at the trailer, after the kids were in bed, Heather and Randy retreated to her room. There, they shared a passionate encounter, during which Heather praised Randy for his understanding of Farley's makeup during their day out. Reflecting on Farley's explanation of wearing makeup like his mom, Randy acknowledged it quietly. The following day, he rushed to work, dozing on the boat ride, contented with the warm reception upon returning. Randy and Heather planned a pizza and arcade outing, considering the children's interest in makeup and the social setting of their next family activity. Heather might not have been convinced by Randy, or perhaps the children's choices influenced the situation, but all three kids were dressed up with rouge, eye shadow, and lip gloss, and had their nails painted a striking blood red. Farley faced some teasing from other boys because of his makeup, but the teasing quickly stopped when Randy, with a serious expression, appeared and stood by Farley's side. Later, the group decided to head back to their trailer. While entering Heather's bedroom, Randy mentioned, You know, my place has a swimming pool. Oh? Heather responded, stepping out of her tight jeans. Randy continued, There are also some charcoal grills. How about a swim party tomorrow? No need for makeup then, Randy thought to himself. Despite this, the four Aquines, including Farley in a one-piece swimsuit similar to his mother's, still wore makeup. Randy felt uneasy about the revealing swimsuits Briah and Danielle had on, wondering where Heather had found such outfits for them. Fortunately, it was a weekday and most of the apartment complex residents were at work, so the pool area wasn't crowded. Randy lit the charcoal for the grill while Heather and her children enjoyed the small, chlorine-rich pool. When Randy removed his shirt to join them, Briah, Farley, and Danielle were amazed by the large diamond back rattlesnake tattoo covering Randy's back, a detailed and vibrant piece he got during his time in prison. My dad's in prison, Farley mentioned. Really? Randy inquired. Yes, Briah chimed in. Was it armed robbery, Mom? Heather, with a certain look and tone, signaled to her children she didn't wish to discuss their father's crimes. After eating, Randy led them to his apartment. As they relaxed in the living room, with Farley on the floor watching an animated movie, Heather whispered to Randy about the lack of private space for adults in his apartment. Randy softly replied, emphasizing that a date can still be enjoyable without intimacy. Four months after Randy had assisted Heather in the parking lot of Burns and Burns Grocers, he had cleared his phone of casual acquaintances' contacts. Then Randy suggested the idea of living together. He wanted to relocate Briah, Farley, and Danielle to a new school district, away from their current one, where there had been troubling incidents involving staff misconduct and illegal activities. Moving them to Baylor Lake meant enrolling them at William C. C. Claiborne Elementary School. Sweetheart, your apartment isn't big enough for all five of us, Heather pointed out to Randy. No, but there's a house on Tallow Road with four bedrooms, Randy replied. Farley can have his own room, Briah and Danielle can share another, and we'll sort out our space later, okay? Better sort it out soon, Heather said with a playful laugh. I love you, you know that. The house was a hit with everyone, including Randy, Heather, and the kids. The next time Randy was back from offshore work, he completed the necessary paperwork and became a homeowner. Uncle Jack and Janice came along to help Randy move, eager to meet Heather and her children. 
Sweetheart, how old is she? Janice inquired quietly when Heather was out of the room. Does she have two girls? Or three? Jack wondered, watching the Aquan children crafting Christmas decorations. Farley is just exploring different interests, Randy explained, referring to Farley's unique style. And I think Heather is around 31 or 32. Why? Janice and Jack both hummed in thought, showing a similar reaction when Randy mentioned his plans to propose to Heather. Jack and Janice warmly accepted Farley's handmade origami Christmas tree ornaments, embracing him as they departed from the lively, loving household. And in the summer, I'll bring you some zinnias from my garden, Janice offered to Heather, gesturing towards the unkempt flower bed in front of the house. Heather laughed, that'll be Randy's task, I'm not good with plants. Ooh, I'd love to help with that, Farley said excitedly. See, Mom, Randy grinned, Farley's got the flowers covered. I'm sure he does, Janice replied with a restrained smile. On Christmas Day, Briar and Farley were thrilled, marveling at the generous array of gifts from Santa Claus. Danielle seemed unfazed by the bounty, apparently forgetting the modest previous Christmas. Randy, who was working offshore, found joy in their happiness through their text messages. Danielle also sent him a text wishing him Merry Christmas, attributing her new bike's credit to Santa Claus. Upon Randy's return, Farley eagerly asked, Mr. Randy, will you teach me how to ride this? As he entered the house, of course, buddy, Randy responded, giving Farley a warm hug. Briah, holding her new mountain bike, piped up, and what about me? Definitely, Randy assured her, explaining the basics of biking in a playful way that made them all laugh. Heather greeted Randy warmly, they've been eagerly waiting for you to come back. And what about you? Have you been waiting too? Randy inquired, with a gentle pat before putting on his coat again. Absolutely, Heather smiled, donning her winter coat and thanking him for it. It's lovely, but is it warm enough? Randy asked, concerned as he helped Danielle with her coat. Heather nodded in agreement. As Farley made for the door, Randy reminded him, Farley, hold on, you need to wear your helmet, emphasizing safety. Aw, it really messes up my hair, Farley complained. You know what else can mess up your hair? A car's bumper, Randy retorted. Seriously, who's going to see your hair all messed up? Just you, admitted Farley. Well, you still need to wear your helmet, Randy insisted. After a long day of teaching Briah and Farley to ride their bikes, Randy was worn out. Chasing after a nervous Briah and a weepy Farley along Tallow Road had taken its toll. Once the bikes were stored away, both kids excitedly claimed they'd be biking pros by tomorrow. I'm sure you will be, what's for dinner? Randy inquired. Chili pie, Heather declared. Fantastic, Randy beamed, knowing it was one of Heather's best dishes. On New Year's Eve, the family braved the freezing weather to set off fireworks, while Heather and Danielle occasionally stepped out with hot chocolate, preferring the warmth indoors. Randy managed to make everyone laugh by playfully nuzzling Heather's neck with his cold nose. At midnight, amidst the festive fireworks, Randy proposed to Heather with a ring, leaving her speechless and elated, responding with a joyful nod. When Randy had some time ashore, they asked Shannon Brown, their teenage neighbor, to babysit so Heather and Randy could enjoy a night out. Shannon was quite the head-turner, with her long, light blonde hair and big brown eyes, always looking radiant. Where are you two off to tonight? Shannon asked with a light tone, taking off her coat. We're hitting side by side first, then catching a comedy night of Vermillions, Randy replied with a smile. Oh, Mrs. Wilson. How fortunate you are, Shannon exclaimed. Not Wilson yet, Heather replied with a smile, sharing a quick peck with Randy as he helped her with her coat. Oh, but, wow, do you have a swimming pool? Shannon asked, her eyes catching sight of the in-ground pool through the back atrium doors. Yes, but it's too chilly for a swim now, Farley pointed out to the impressed teenager. And is that eye shadow you're wearing? With a t-shirt, Shannon queried, turning her attention to the boy. Oh no, we need to find you a more suitable shirt. Heather laughed softly, I think she'll fit in perfectly, and with that, they exited the home. In Farley's view, Shannon Brown was worth every dollar Randy gave her for the babysitting time. Both Briah and Danielle took to the charming, amiable teenager, but Farley was particularly enchanted and eagerly inquired about when Shannon would visit next. Shannon, being an adept cyclist, was instrumental in teaching Farley and, to a lesser degree, Briah and Danielle as well. She declined Randy's monetary offer, insisting that as neighbors, they should naturally assist each other. Upon Randy's suggestion of dining at Manny's Mexican restaurant followed by bowling at Bolo Rama, Farley excitedly pleaded for Shannon's inclusion. We'll compensate you as if it's a babysitting gig, Randy quietly offered over the phone. Not at all, Shannon countered softly. Consider it a date. You don't think her mother actually let her leave the house in that outfit, Heather remarked to Randy, hinting at Shannon's casual dress. Interestingly, I can't recall ever seeing Kathy wearing one either, Randy observed, referring to Shannon's mother. You noticed. Heather retorted, playfully tapping Randy's arm. So, Mr. Randy, what's with the bald look? Shannon inquired, curiously stroking Randy's smooth scalp. It's not due to hair loss, right? In Stratton, lice were a huge issue, Randy explained. Despite the preventive treatments, lice were rampant. We had no choice but to shave it all off. 
Everything, Shannon asked, her eyes widening with curiosity. Mind your own business, Heather snapped curtly. Heather was visibly annoyed by the girl's smug expression. However, the mood shifted when Farley's awkward flirting with Shannon caught their attention. The arrival of their meals interrupted any further discussions. At the bowling alley, Heather suggested forming two teams, Randy and Mom against Shannon, Briah, and Farley. The group enjoyed a lively evening, playfully competing and cheering each other on. After dropping Shannon home, she once again refused Randy's offer of money. Is it all? Heather whispered eagerly to Randy in their bed, after tucking Briah, Farley, and Danielle in. Yes, all of it. Curious. Randy responded with a laugh, leaning in for a kiss. Wow, Randy, you're full of surprises. Heather giggled, amazed by his revelation. Later, in their intimate conversation, Heather accidentally let slip that neither Damien nor Donnie, Damien's father, were Briah's biological father. She believed Donnie, Damien's father, to be the actual father of Farley and Danielle. Damien was in jail when Farley was conceived. Regarding Danielle, the timing suggested Donnie was likely her father. Does Brian know about her real dad? Randy inquired. No, why should she? Heather countered. What about this David guy? Is he like Damien or Donnie? Randy asked further. Donnie wasn't bad, and David, he's a decent man with a stable job, Heather confessed. Oh, I have a job too. Does that make me a decent man? Randy joked, grinning. You, I'm not so sure, Heather teased. But really, shouldn't Brian know about her dad? What if she needs medical history or something? Randy persisted. Heather promised to get in touch with David and tell him about his daughter. However, their hectic schedules from Tuesday to Tuesday left Randy with little chance to bring up the subject again, as they were constantly caught up with other pressing matters. With the arrival of spring, Randy busied himself with outdoor chores like cleaning and preparing the pool, despite his protestations to Briah, Farley, and Danielle that it was still too chilly for swimming. He also begrudgingly tended to the lawn, which he disliked intensely. Meanwhile, Heather was deeply engrossed in organizing their wedding, often consulting with Janice, Randy's mother, over the phone. Janice harbored reservations about her son's engagement to Heather, who was almost a decade his senior and already had a family. However, she acknowledged Heather's efforts to involve her in the wedding preparations. Uncle Jack praised Farley to Randy, noting the boy's affectionate attempts to chat with his grandmother during Heather's phone calls. Randy acknowledged his stepson's amiable nature. On April 27, the children excitedly pressured Randy for a swim, which he agreed to after checking with their mother. Randy was curious about Farley's sudden dash outside, and Heather implied it was to invite Shannon over, signaling a change into swimwear. Randy jokingly suggested inviting Shannon's mother too, which Heather mockingly dismissed. As the children scampered about, Farley, in his unique swimsuit, joined the excitement about Shannon's arrival. Heather, half-jokingly, questioned Randy's focus on Shannon's eye-catching swimwear, feigning jealousy. When Shannon arrived, Heather felt a surge of competitiveness, noticing how Shannon admired Randy's physique. Shannon's reaction to Randy's tattoo further sparked Heather's protective instincts. Randy, joining the children in the pool, playfully remarked on the water's temperature, maintaining the light-hearted atmosphere. No, it's not, Briar insisted. Briar, look at you, all shivery, Randy chuckled, yet he joined in the pool fun. He carried Danielle around the pool piggyback. Briar wanted her turn too, which led Farley to seek a piggyback ride from Randy. Don't even, Heather warned Shannon sternly. Shannon just gave a mischievous grin in response, then playfully pounced on Farley. This sparked a playful chase, with Shannon and Farley teaming up to playfully ambush Briya. Didn't feel like swimming. Randy quipped, settling beside Heather on a pool chair. Smart people know it's freezing, Heather retorted. Let's warm up with some chili pie, they'll be freezing by the time they realize it's cold, Randy suggested. On May 18th, mere days before their wedding, Heather reluctantly informed Randy that Damien had been released early from Mumphrey State Penitentiary. Randy felt a surge of anger. I have to head to the offshore rig soon, Randy mentioned, grabbing his duffel bag. You didn't just find this out, did you? Heather fumbled for words, avoiding Randy's gaze. We'll discuss this when I return, Randy decided. I need to make that trip to earn my pay. During the drive from Baylor Lake to the Industrial Canal, Randy was consumed by thoughts of Heather's nervous admission about her ex-boyfriend's release. Returning home on June 1st, Randy was met with silence and a foul smell. He discovered damage throughout the house, including broken items and his ruined television. Furious, Randy dialed the number. Officer Rochelle Esposito arrived to document the extensive damage, visibly dismayed by the senseless destruction. Ah, man, Randy exhaled deeply upon discovering that Briah's and Danielle's room was vacant. The emptiness of Farley's room also struck a chord. Can you believe this? Randy yelled, confronted with the mess in the bedroom he had shared with Heather. You see this? He's going to regret it, Officer Esposito remarked, capturing a photo of the mess left on the pristine sheets. He's known to us, right? We'll find his traces in this. And what? Heather said he just got released. As if he has the means to compensate for any of this, Randy retorted sharply. 
the garage was empty of the three bicycles. It seemed Damien bore no grudge against the household appliances. Neither the washing machine, dryer, nor the lawnmower were disturbed. Oh, look, that's my car, Randy noted, recalling Heather's 2008 Toyota Camry. In truth, if Heather had just taken her belongings in the car, Randy would have let it go. He would have been deeply saddened, mourning the end of his bond with Heather and her children. He could have overlooked the loss of furniture, clothes, bicycles, and the car. However, the deliberate and spiteful wreckage of his home, home he had provided, was something Randy could not overlook. This act by Damien Hebert would not go unchallenged. Does she still have a key to the house? Rochelle inquired, continuously updating her notes on her tablet. Yeah, I think so, her keys aren't here, Randy responded. Have you tried calling her? Rochelle questioned, getting ready to request a kit for analyzing the mess in the bedroom. No, I haven't, Randy admitted, pulling out his cell phone. Hello, chuckled a voice on the other end. Damien, is that you? Give me my phone, Randy heard Heather in the background. Hey, I'm on the phone, Randy caught before the call was abruptly cut off. Well, she hasn't blocked my number, Randy told Rochelle. Hand it over, Rochelle demanded, reaching out. Yes, what do you want? Damien snapped. Sir, this is Officer Rochelle Esposito from the Baylor Lake Police Department. Where are you? Rochelle demanded, her voice steeped in command. Officer Ro. Dot 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 oh, that cat. That darn cat. He called the. Damien stammered, abruptly ending the call. In less than 40 minutes, the Baylor Lake Police Department had located Damien Donald Hebert. His cousin's address was on file with Vanessa Leblanc, his probation officer. Consequently, the Baylor Lake Police asked their counterparts in Kimball to apprehend Damien Donald Hebert. The following morning, Randy was in the courtroom when Damien was ushered in. Randy felt his heart sink at the sight of Heather, who appeared worn and defeated, observing the lineup of men being led into the courtroom. Mr. Randy, hi, Farley exclaimed, rushing towards Randy's seat. Hey buddy, oh, what's with the new haircut? Randy inquired, gently touching Farley's freshly shorn head. Dad insisted I get it cut, Farley muttered, visibly upset. Hi Mr. Randy, Danielle greeted brightly. Oh, don't worry, it'll grow back, Randy comforted Farley, embracing him. Hi Danielle, why, why call the police? Heather asked sharply, pulling Farley away from Randy. You're kidding, right? Randy replied incredulously. Your husband wreaked havoc, destroyed my belongings, and you question why. You're out of touch with reality, don't you see? No, he didn't, Heather retorted, aghast. So, you're saying you did all that? Randy challenged, frustration in his voice. And where's my ring? I left it on your nightstand, in the dish, Heather responded. Then Damien must have it, Randy concluded, managing to briefly embrace Danielle. I, just, oh, this is too much, Heather muttered repeatedly. Hi Mr. Randy, Mama, Daddy's over there, Briah said, pointing out her father to Heather. Hello sweetie, Randy greeted, embracing Briah warmly. You're kidding me, he really did all that. Unbelievable, Heather muttered, her eyes fixed on the now sullen and disheveled Damien Donald Hebert, who was seated among the other inmates in their orange attire. As Damien stood before the judge with his public defender, Judge Marie Robichox looked on disapprovingly. The courtroom listened as Kenneth Prigian, J.R., the assistant district attorney, recited the charges. The judge then glanced at Tanisha Brown-Jones, the public defender, who simply declared not guilty and seemed to immediately shift her focus to other matters. What do we do now? Breyer inquired, watching Damien rejoin the other detainees. I suppose we head back to Robert's place, Heather replied. I want to go with Mr. Randy, Danielle interjected loudly. Heather replied sharply, you can't go with Mr. Randy, her gaze hardened towards Damien. Damien seemed detached, paying no attention to his girlfriend or her children, just waiting for his return to the detention center. Looks like you're heading back to Mumphrey, right, Hebert? Another detainee remarked. Seems so. It's not a big deal anyway, Damien responded indifferently. That Snickle will be thrilled to have his buddy back, the other man snickered. Janice, Randy's mother, tried to show support, though Randy sensed her relief about the wedding being called off. Uncle Jack offered more empathy than Randy's mother, and his words about losing Briah and the kids only intensified Randy's pain. With a deep sigh, Randy mentioned to Uncle Jack that he had cleanup tasks to attend to. Randy was disposing of carpet and padding pieces in the dumpster when Shannon appeared, riding her sleek bike. Her eyes widened in surprise upon seeing Randy with the dumpster. What's going on? Why are you throwing this out? Shannon asked, slowing down and stopping her bike. Randy couldn't help but notice Shannon's appearance, thinking to himself about the striking image she presented. Out loud, he mentioned to the young woman that someone had ruined the expensive carpet. Shannon inquired how Randy knew it was connected to Heather. It's because Heather and the kids are no longer here, Randy explained, causing Shannon to look surprised, her brown eyes widening. Well, we still need to clean up, Randy remarked, heading back to the garage. They left, Shannon asked, pausing with her bicycle at the garage entrance. Yes, they're gone, confirmed Randy. Shortly after, Shannon joined Randy inside, now dressed in a snug t-shirt and worn sweatpants. Her blonde hair pulled back under a bandana. Observing the ruined carpet, she shook her head and started helping Randy remove it. What's going on here? 
Randy queried as they lifted a piece of carpet. Shannon replied, where are you thinking of buying the new carpet? There's a place on Turner that's pretty good. My mom prefers the store next to Wilson's Fabrics. They have quick service, but it's pricey. If you want, I can let them in when you're not around. Randy raised an eyebrow at her offer to hold a key to his place. Shannon continued, discussing color options for the house, suggesting a blend of beige and brown for the living room. Right, Randy responded, noticing the outline of her shirt changing as they worked. As they moved the old couch, exposing the last piece of carpet, Shannon suggested a new color scheme for what used to be Farley's room. Randy, with a heavy heart, informed her they took everything, even the bunk beds. Shannon paused, at a loss for words. Randy shook his head as he caught the mischievous grin on Shannon's face. While he swept the stark concrete floor, he pondered what would happen if he ever gave Shannon the keys to his place. Do you plan on keeping the walls this color? Shannon inquired, meandering from the living room to the front door. Look at this, you hit the stud right here. What color do you suggest? Randy asked, mixing ammonia with warm water. For the carpet, maybe a nice shade of sand. Not too dark, Shannon advised. Actually, a pale pink could brighten up the space. Shannon then perused the kitchen and dining area, her gaze gliding over the tiled floors and faux granite countertops. Randy cleaned the floor, his attention occasionally drifting to Shannon's movements. The sweatpants she wore were loose, but they hinted at her form as she leaned over to inspect various details. For this room, maybe an ice yellow, with a demi-gloss finish, Shannon suggested. And these cabinet handles, did you choose these chrome ones? I'd have gone with an antique brass, it would complement the cabinet colors nicely. We really should add some color in here, Shannon remarked, finishing her tour of the downstairs. Uh-huh, Randy responded, wringing out the mop. So, any dinner plans? Shannon inquired, heading towards the open garage door. No, not really, Randy confessed. I'm making my special sausage and linguine tonight, around 6.30, Shannon announced. Should I bring anything? Randy asked, with a smile. Some Turling's beer would be nice. Barley or wheat, either one works, Shannon replied, then crossed the street. See you at 6.30. Sure thing, Randy said, returning to his task of cleaning the kitchen counters. At 5.30, Randy got ready, choosing a neat button-down shirt, khakis, and brown leather loafers. He stopped by Burns and Burns Grocers to pick up a six-pack of wheat turlings and barley turlings beer. A quick online search led him to a half-gallon bottle of red wine. Encountering a crowded aisle, he navigated to another and selected a bouquet of flowers. Flowers in a grocery store. Randy mused aloud, puzzled by the sight. Nothing beats flowers when it comes to making an impression. The employee at Burns and Burns Grocers grinned, packing a vase of vibrant spring flowers. Randy, half distracted, thought, it's not just about making an impression, as he added another vase, this one filled with pink roses, to his cart. The store clerk teased him about needing two bouquets, questioning if he was in the doghouse for some reason. Just mind your own business, Randy replied with a light-hearted smile, steering his cart towards the checkout. At the register, the lady seemed familiar. Remember me, Penny Richards, from the bungalow with the quaint blue windmill in the yard, she refreshed his memory with a smile. They exchanged a few words of small talk before Randy wished her a pleasant evening. Upon reaching his destination, Claude Brown, the homeowner, barely managed a grunt at the sight of Randy with the flower vases. He grudgingly opened the door wider to let him in. Claude's warmth is indeed overwhelming, Kathy Brown remarked with a sharp look at her husband's unwelcoming demeanor. We've exchanged waves, but never formally met. I'm Kathy Brown. Randy Wilson, he introduced himself, offering the spring bouquet to her. These are for you. Oh, how lovely. Claude, look at this, Kathy exclaimed, eliciting a noncommittal grunt from Claude as he barely acknowledged the gesture. By the way, something smells fantastic, Randy complimented. Mr. Brown, your home is truly welcoming. Thank you, Claude finally spoke, showing a hint of politeness. Just in time. I brought along some beer and wine too, Randy mentioned, hoping to lighten the atmosphere. Beer, you say. Now that's more like it, Claude's demeanor shifted to one of genuine interest. Barley turlings. And wheat. Excellent choice. Shannon was busy in the kitchen, carefully adding the linguine to a pot of boiling water when her attention was caught by a vase of pink roses, eliciting a delighted squeal from her. Oh, thank you, but you didn't have to do that, she said, moving closer to Randy with a smile. She wore a light beige sleeveless dress that seamlessly blended with her complexion. Her attire subtly outlined her figure, hinting at her slim build. As she moved, the dress clung to her, revealing the contours of her form. It's almost ready, why don't you head to the dining room? Suggested Shannon. I, uh, so where are you all from originally? Randy inquired, as they settled in the formal dining room, the aroma of dinner filling the air. This doesn't smell like any Cajun dish I know. I'm from Commonstead, New Jersey, Claude chimed in. And I hail from Achel, Ohio, added Kathy. She's a Dewhurst, Shannon interjected, bringing a basket of warm garlic bread to the table. A what? Randy was puzzled. Dewhurst. Conrad Dewhurst. Shannon hinted. Darling, outside of Achel, the name Conrad Dewhurst doesn't ring any bells, Kathy pointed out. And nobody is bothered by that. 
Claude remarked, taking a large swig of his Barley Turling's beer. Dad, Shannon chided, her expression showing her disapproval. Throughout the meal, Kathy, Shannon, and Randy enjoyed a rich red wine, while Claude preferred Barley Turling's beer, partaking modestly in the linguine and sausage draped in a hearty marinara sauce. My comment, part two ending will come out later in the day, need to rest my hands a little bit before part two. Hope you guys are enjoying the stories so far, I have worked hard recently at uploading. Check out the other Love TV videos down below, and I will see you in the next one.